Hello, I'm Mark Barley. The Narcotrend team have invited me to give a brief presentation on my choice of processed EEG hot topic. I have not received any payment. I'm sure many of you will have re read the 2021 standards of monitoring and would have been pleased to see support for the use of processed EEG for both TIVA and volatile based anesthesia. I was really pleased to see the statement that we should not rely solely on index values displayed by our monitors and that we should develop a basic understanding of the EEG waveform and be able to interpret information from power spectral analysis, density spectral array and relative band powers. Over the next few minutes, I'd like to demonstrate with clinical examples how you can use these techniques to gather additional information to better understand the oscillations the anaesthetized brain produces. First, a little basic science. The EEG is a complex non-repeating waveform. What we see is a composite of different frequencies produced by many thousands of synapses as they depolarize. To visualize these frequencies, a fast Fourier transform is applied to the filtered EEG to quantify the distribution of EEG power into a range of frequencies. This can be visualized as a power spectrum, a density spectral array, or a graph of relative band activity. At last year's meeting, I was pleased to explore the benefits of density spectral array. This brief primer is available to review on YouTube via the link in this QR code if you scan it with your smartphone. The QR code will be repeated on the last slide. So what is a power spectrum? A power spectrum demonstrates the frequency distribution of an EEG epoch, which is a term for a segment of the EEG. Frequency is plotted along the x-axis with slower frequencies to the left and faster frequencies to the right. Power is demonstrated on the y-axis. You can think of the height of the peaks as the EEG energy or amount of a particular frequency. The density spectral array is derived from this power spectrum and understanding its formation makes appreciating the nuances of the DSA more straightforward. Here we have a large peak in the slow delta frequency range and another in the alpha band. And this is a typical plot for propofol. One of the most useful features of the power spectrum is that it's rapidly processed and useful for near real time monitoring. I find it useful during induction and it's my go to view during this phase where I observe changes in the raw EEG and power spectrum simultaneously, which can be correlated with the clinical picture. I'd like to show you an example to illustrate the changes that we see during induction. This is an EEG and power spectrum of an 18-year-old girl undergoing a rapid sequence induction for laparoscopic appendicectomy with a TIVA TCI technique, and the EEG is playing in real time to demonstrate the speed of changes. Here we see some delta oscillations form with loss of consciousness, and you'll notice that these delta oscillations are so large that at this scale, they disappear off the top of the screen. The scaling on this device is adjustable. The next clip will highlight the magnitude of these slow oscillations at the time of loss of consciousness, the amplitude of which during maintenance versus induction is being investigated as a parameter known as slow wave saturation by Professor Tracy's group in Oxford. Demonstrating that huge delta amplitude at loss of consciousness is a 27 year old male undergoing a TCI induction. I've chosen a power scale of 500 microvolts for this young brain, some eight times larger than the previous video. If we watch here, we're gonna see some very, very large delta oscillations, almost touching the top of the screen. And here they come, huge great big delta oscillations with loss of consciousness following a bolus of propofol. Very, very high amplitude. Remembering this is some 500 microvolts. On this device, it's possible to change the scale in real time to better visualize the alpha delta oscillations, as we can see here. This is more commensurate with propofol maintenance. As we know, different anesthetic agents work as a range of receptors and pathways to produce the anesthetized state. Ketamine causes processed EEG monitors a bit of confusion, as paradoxically, despite producing hypnosis, higher frequency oscillations are produced due to its excitatory effects, even with a subhypnotic dose. In this example, 
you'll see the excitatory effect of a small dose of ketamine on the background of a propofol TCI maintenance infusion, which produces a characteristic 15 hertz oscillation, visible around two minutes after administration. This example is sped up 10 times. You'll see that this is going to nicely demonstrate the transitory effect of ketamine and explains a bit why monitors calculated around GABAergic agents may produce high index values, which in my experience lasts about 15 to 45 minutes. And there's that 15 hertz ketamine oscillation that we see with the maintenance uh, infusion of propofol. It's really helpful to familiarize ourselves with the neuropharmacology of our drugs to understand some of these changes. Volatile agents act on a wider range of receptors than propofol. One can observe a concentration specific increase in theta oscillations here, which become more obvious on the power spectrum and density spectral array above one MAC. This is currently felt to represent a dose dependent agonism of T type calcium channels, which causes a profound thalamic differentiation. Low frequency beta oscillations are also more apparent. Than when propofol is used. Relative band activity is an accessible way of building skills in EEG interpretation, as well as very useful in visualizing the arousal and emergence. This is a typical TCI plot with a slow induction. First, we see an increase in beta activity with the onset of sedation, followed by an increase in delta and then alpha power, which is characteristic of propofol. In this case, with the cessation of the infusion, we see the delta and alpha power fall and an increase in the faster beta and gamma frequency oscillations before waking. Older patients may display different emergence trajectories. Relative band activity can be useful in demonstrating the EEG signs of cortical arousal, namely beta, delta and alpha dropout. Here's an example of beta arousal occurring following laryngoscopy. This is a basic RSI technique with alfentanil, sodium thiopental, and rocuronium, moving to sevoflurane for maintenance. Thio works incredibly quickly, and you'll see in a moment some huge delta oscillations appearing. Here they come. Intubation was straightforward and performed with VL by an experienced consultant. Thiopental has a very short KEO. Watch for the flattening of the EEG and the loss of delta power following the stimulus of laryngoscopy. After the stimulus of laryngoscopy had passed, and as the sevoflurane effect site concentration increases, we see a transition to a much more satisfactory delta and theta EEG pattern commensurate with volatile anesthesia. There was no recall of interoperative events. A TIVA TCI technique with continuous delivery of hypnotic agent can prevent what NAP5 termed the gap, which we saw here. Without EEG monitoring, it's impossible to observe these changes in brain state and to take corrective action. Over the past few slides, I've avoided all mention of index values, concentrating on using multiple intuitive methods to visualize the frequency distribution of the EEG to support clinical decision-making and optimize drug dosing as recommended by the standards of monitoring. If you're interested in processed EEG monitoring or have clinical questions about the presentation, then don't hesitate to get in touch. I hope you enjoy the rest of the meeting.